money's in my bank account. $72.7 million. The first thing I would say you should do is develop a phone addiction. You're in debt. You're broke. I've made over $500,000 at 15 years old. He told the court, quote, I cannot offer you an excuse for my behavior. How do you excuse lying to your brother and your two sons? These gurus exist in all different industries, especially the real estate industry. And I think they stop a lot of people from getting started. And so I wanted to go through eight different things that these gurus say about real estate that aren't exactly like they sound. These guys say things like, I own 150 properties, or I own 300 properties, or 3,000 properties. And gosh, that'll make you feel small. But this is what they actually mean when they're saying that. It means they have interest in 3,000 properties, meaning they have some piece of ownership, generally through different companies and through syndications, which basically means they've raised other people's money in a group to buy those properties. So they own a small piece of interest in those properties. Let's say that there's 20 properties inside of that fund and they have a 5% interest in the fund. Well, that's like you owning one house fully to yourself. It's not that impressive. It just looks impressive. Now, I'm not knocking that as a strategy. We do some of the same things ourselves. I'm just saying, if I say I own 150 properties, it's not really all that impressive. Now let's talk about what it looks like when you actually just own the property 100% yourself. It sounds something like this. I bought this house with cash, they say. Well, sometimes. I mean, there are people who have the cash in their bank account to go buy these houses. But most of the time, that's not the way you would execute a house purchase. You see, real estate is one of the easiest purchases to make with other people's money, OPM. You can get money from the bank on a 30-year mortgage. You can get money from hard money lenders on the riskier types of deals. You can raise private equity from people that you know. You can raise money in a syndication. Heck, I even know people who do crowdfunding online. Even if you had the cash in the bank, you would probably use one of those other strategies. Why? Because eventually, no matter how much cash you have, it's gonna run out. And if you really wanna scale your organization, you have to do it with other people's money. This is one of my favorites. And I also understand why people do it. It's just easier to explain the spread of a deal when you leave out some of the details. And I think some people are actually fooling themselves. They think they're making money when they're actually not. Here's what it sounds like. Acquisition price, $150,000. Rehab, $50,000. Sold for 300,000. Spread, 100,000, right? The problem is, in reality, there are dozens of other costs, like closing costs, wholesale fee, marketing costs to find the deal, title insurance, house insurance, property taxes, income taxes, utilities, interest on the loan, points on the loan, home inspector fees, appraisal fees, real estate commissions, title insurance, I flipped this house in seven days, $100,000 rehab in 30 days. Well, good luck. Now, maybe they did do that. And you know, we've done projects like that, but the reality is different for people who are doing these projects at scale versus somebody who's just getting started out or only doing a few projects at a time. You see, those people probably have internal crews that are at their beck and call. And so they can focus all of their attention on this one house for seven days. But that's not the reality for most because you're using subcontractors who have their own priorities. And so you have to work on a different schedule. Plus, are they even mentioning getting permits, inspections from the city, inspections from their hard money lender? What about planning for the project? What about getting the real estate agent in there to get ready to sell it? Did that happen in seven days? What happens as you start to scale is you do get stronger relationships with these contractors where they actually know the next project that they're gonna be doing is coming from you. It gives them what I call job confidence. So it is easier to use those people like their internal crew, and then they will stay focused on your project and your project only, and you can get things done a little bit quicker. The point is that when you hear the gurus talking about how fast they did a project, there's probably more to the story than you're actually hearing. And truly, I think it's more important that you stay steady, focus on your budget, focus on your scope of work, and stay in the game long enough to build the skills and the team to where you really can start to speed up. You've definitely heard I've done hundreds of flips. You know why? Because I say it. 
But what does it actually mean? Does it mean that the person has bought a house, done a full renovation on it, and then sold it? Sometimes. But a lot of times it means something different. In fact, most of the time people are talking about flipping a house, they're actually talking about what you call wholesaling. I'm not knocking wholesaling. That's how I started out in this business as well. And a lot of people do and should, but it's not the same as how most people look at flipping. Here's the process. Person A, a home seller, agrees to sell you their house for $160,000. Now you have that under contract. You go to person B, a cash buyer, and you say, I'll sell this house to you for $175,000. Now you've never actually taken possession of that house. Therefore, what you've actually sold is your place in the contract to purchase the home for $160,000. When they go to actually close and the cash buyer takes possession of the house, you'll get the difference between the 175 and the 160. You'll put $15,000 in your pocket and you never had to spend a dime, except for marketing dollars. Since you didn't need any money out of your own pocket, you can really do that at a larger scale. And that's how most people flip a hundred properties. As with any type of investment, people like to talk a lot about their net worth. And specifically to real estate, people will also talk about their monthly revenue from rentals. And sometimes when you hear these numbers, they seem so huge that they can't be believable. And I felt that way myself. And there was actually a situation with a couple people that I knew that were talking about the same thing. And I realized when they were talking about their net worth, they actually weren't talking about net worth. They were talking about the total value of their assets. And when they were talking about their monthly cash flow, well, they didn't mean cash flow. They meant their monthly gross revenue. That's a huge difference. You see, when you talk about net worth, what you're actually talking about is your total assets minus the liability. So you take a house, for example. The house may be worth $300,000, but you have a $250,000 loan on it. Well, your actual net worth from that property is only $50,000, but a lot of people accidentally say $300,000 instead. And when they talk about their monthly cash flow from rentals, well, yeah, they got $2,000 a month from the tenant, but then they had to pay for their mortgage. They had to pay for maintenance and insurance and taxes. So it's not really $2,000, right? Have you ever heard investors talk about how you have to set up your LLC in Wyoming because of certain rules that they have that you don't have where you're living? Or maybe you have to set it up in Nevada. Or maybe you need an S Corp. Or maybe you need a C Corp. Is it a partnership, a limited partnership? Well, here's the thing. I think most of the companies who do that for you are just trying to sell LLC setups. This is the part of the business that terrifies most people and actually prevents them from getting started. But the reality of this business and most other businesses is people spend a lot of time thinking about how they need to better protect themselves and how they need to set up their books in the perfect way before they've ever even made a dollar. Well, until you make a dollar, you have nothing to protect or plan for anyway. So I suggest that instead of talking about all this, you set up a simple structure and you go out and figure out how you make money and then worry about that other stuff. You're always gonna hear the gurus and the forums talking about building your team of advisors, just like Robert Kiyosaki, Rich Dad Poor Dad style. And I believe that too, I truly do. But I think a lot of people miss the point. I get calls from new investors all the time who are just out there trying to build their team. You might be led to believe that you're just gonna find all these people that will fill your depth chart of advisors and they're just gonna instinctually finish the project for you and put profit in your pocket but the reality is they have their own priorities. As the investor and the business owner, you need to be the one that casts the vision, sets the expectation, and ultimately holds the accountability. But here's the key, is your depth chart doesn't have to be huge. You really don't need that much to get started out. You really need to focus on wholesalers and or real estate agents so you can find a deal, and then a couple of good contractors to execute the plan, and then you take the house to market. And if you haven't messed up too bad, somebody's gonna buy it. In fact, every house sells, so you don't have too much to worry about.